And so we have a missionary, Jim and Sue Tagliolatel, the family, in Spain. I, I, I think this is their 20th year or something like that, right? Um, so they've, they've been there for some time laboring among those people. Uh, and so we wanted to go and partner and encourage them and help benefit the work there, which is an act of faith on, on the part of these people. The church doesn't pay for this. These people, they have to, they have to see God bless. They have to see God provide. And then when they get there, they want to be vessels to be used. And, and that's what I've asked them to do is come tonight and kind of tell us what God did uh, in them and through them. Uh, what they saw and what encouraged them and what they were, how they were used in and through all of this. So, Alex, I believe um, you're going to start us off, I think, right? Okay, go ahead. Okay. All right, well, uh, are we on? Yep. Uh, my name is Alex Sluk, and uh, I had the uh, honor and uh, privilege to be able to lead this uh, group of fine people. Yeah, most of them. All right. Um, and it was just, I, I want to thank uh, Pastor Kevin, Pastor Don, for uh, allowing me this opportunity to do this. Uh, as Pastor Kevin was mentioning, the Tagliatellas have been uh, there in Spain for about 20 years. And the main focus of what we did to help them out there was speak English in Spain. Uh, one of the main focuses of their ministry right now is reaching people and helping them to practice their English, teaching English classes, uh, things like that. We did that for a few of the nights, and we'll expound upon that throughout the time that everyone has to uh, tell about their testimonies. Uh, and then we also had the opportunity to travel to a few of the towns, help some of the local missionaries that are there uh, with evangelism within the towns. Um, so that's the brief snapshot of what we did most of the time. We spent about nine or ten days there, had a little bit of time for sightseeing at the end in Madrid, um, and, th and that was about it. So I'm going to start off with uh, Fred Sanchez, and then we'll just go right down the line with what the Lord showed us. Hi, Fred Sanchez. I got to tell you, it's really bright up here. Should have worn my sunglasses. I want, now I know why Pastor puts makeup on. You can probably see all the blemishes. <laughs> well, my trip in Spain, I'm, my name is Fred Sanchez, and my heritage, my great-grandfather came from Spain, um, Gabriel his name was, and when I stepped out into Spain, and my background as far as religion, I was very, very deep in Catholicism, the Catholic Church. Um, you know, some people say, oh, I'm Catholic, but like, we were really Catholic. You know, I was an altar boy. My father was faithful in the church and uh, all that stuff. And uh, I was an altar boy for three years. And um, what impressed me about Spain and really, really touched me was <clears throat> you can see the difference in the spirit in the United States and then in Spain. Um, America comes from a Judeo-Christian history. And the Spirit of God, believe it or not, is here. And in Spain, it's full of big cathedrals, people professing to be Catholics, very serious about their church and their worship of Mary. But their heart is so darkened. And what touched me was me coming from a Catholic background and my family was faithful Catholics and we were really into church. I went even to a parochial school. I just thank the Lord that he opened my eyes. I thank the Lord that at a young age, I was, I was 11 years old when I was a, a, an altar boy, and I saw religion, but it was empty. But, but, but the Lord opened my eyes. And over there in Spain, when you talk about Jesus or you talk about Christianity, they, I mean, immediately changed the subject. Um, and I think that's what really got me the most, what, what I saw, that over here in America, the spirit of the Lord is here because of our history. But in Spain, 
the God of this world, really, you can really, really feel how he has just darkened their eyes and their minds. And, and what Jim and Sue are doing over there is really exciting. Uh, um, uh, I was very comfortable with it. I was never a soul winner that can just walk up to people and say, hey, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven or hell? Or I was never that way. I can never come to someone that way. I, I could just befriend them first and make a good friendship or relationship and, and then bring in the gospel. That's how I am naturally. Um, well, what Jim and Sue do over there is exactly that. So it, it, I was very comfortable over there. Uh, um, you know, when we stepped off the plane, my wife and I, we didn't get jet lag. Everyone's talking about jet lag and did you sleep and uh, we stepped out of the airplane like we stepped out of Rochester. I was very comfortable. Um, I, I, I absolutely, I got to tell you, I loved it over there. I really did. So I'm thinking, well, <clears throat> if I love it so much over here, that means God's not calling me. Because <laughs> I'm used to hearing people say, oh, I didn't want to go to that field, and it was this way, and, uh, and it was just hard to be over there. So I really liked it a lot. And my, in a personal note, when we were leaving, uh, the night we were leaving, I, I was praying, and um, I recall Genesis 24 when... Uh, Abraham's servant went to Rebecca's home and they, he asked for her and, and, and the brother and the father said, well, let, let us ask her, does she want to go with you? And she responded, I'll go. And in my soul, in my spirit, the Lord asked me, would you want to go to Spain? And I'm not saying he, by no means, but my response spiritually was, Lord, I would go. And I'm available. And um, I just praise the Lord for that experience. Uh, I, I thank him for Brother Sue and uh, bro Sister Sue and Brother Jim, what they're doing. And uh, it was a uh, wonderful time. I really enjoyed it. Uh, well, this was our... Uh, my really both of our first missions trip uh, we've never taken a missions trip before and um, I was really overwhelmed because um, it went so well I mean we've only been here at First Bible for a year and I knew some of the people just you know from Sunday or Wednesday just hello but not really knowing them and um, I have to say we spent 10 days together we traveled for 20 hours. We took trains, metros, trams, buses. I mean, we really, really traveled a lot. And this team was phenomenal. I, I you know, there was, as far as I know, <laughs> I didn't hear any complaining, any murmuring. We just all had one mind and one spirit. It was just incredible. I, I just, I was so overwhelmed by how our unity, and there was, 12 of us all together when we got Sue and uh, Jim and Denise Hutchinson, Hutchinson, she was from Ukraine, she met us there. So as we traveled, there were 12 of us and we traveled by tram all the time or we took the metro and uh, one funny, um, I mean, everything went perfect. Like our flights, we just, you know, nothing went wrong except one little hiccup. <laughs> Jim said, now make sure when you get on the tram, you have to just all go in together. Just go in, don't hesitate, just go. Okay, push. So we're standing there waiting for the tram and we get in and all of a sudden in front of me, the doors just close. So there's Fred, myself, and Jane, Ashley, I think, yeah, um, Therese. And I could see Denise's face. She was like, we left them, you know, so okay. So, but we, Jane was there too. So we calmly said, okay, let's just walk to that little kiosk to find out how can we get uh, one of those tickets so we can get on the tram. But all of a sudden, you know, we looked back and there is Jim. He had gotten off and he was coming to rescue us. 
And really, that was the worst. That was uh, really, it really wasn't the worst, but that was the only thing that really went wrong in 10 days for 12 people traveling together. And that was just the hand of the Lord. I, I just, you know, I was just so overwhelmed how the Lord just answered every single prayer. Because, uh, you know, we had prepared, we had meetings, we even read a book. And, uh, but you never know what you're going to encounter when you go on these trips. And just the Lord uh, was just um, in our trip from beginning to end. We got home, another 20 hours to get home, and it was just incredible. Um, my walk has definitely changed because of this trip. Um, I've been a Christian since, you know, I was 16 years old, and I've seen the Lord just answer many, many prayers in my life. Uh, but this trip to Spain just did something deep for me, and I'm so grateful that I was able to go. And, um, and one more note, um, uh, Jane, no, it was... Um, Gail and um, Nancy and Therese and Ashley, we were in charge of Sunday school. Uh, so we did Sunday school in Spanish. I had to teach in Spanish, and they were my assistants. But it was just so, once again, the Lord just put it all together. You know, Nancy came up with the gospel wheel. We'll do the gospel wheel. Okay, I've never done the gospel wheel, but we'll do it. And I'll do it in Spanish. I'll just translate, you know. And then, so we got together, and okay, we have to do a memory verse. Okay, let's pick a memory verse. So I picked Acts 16.31. So here, uh, so we get, you know, that was our memory verse. I prepared it in, in Spanish so the kids could, re, you know, recite their verse. Well, while we were there, we went to a village in Honduras. It was about an hour and a half from where we were, and it was in a little village of 18,000 people, 8,000 8, people, and this missionary that's also been there for 20 years has a little small church, 15. And we were there that Saturday to pass out the Gospel of John. And when we get into this little build, well, it was really like an apartment, just one little room, and I looked on the wall, and in Spanish was Acts 16.31. It was my memory verse. So and I said, Lord, here, Gail and I were sitting in Rochester uh, on a Wednesday night after Bible study trying to figure out what we're going to do. And there's my memory verse in Spain on this missionary's wall. You know, it just, it just touched my heart. You know, only the Lord could just orchestrate things like that for my benefit. So I just praise the Lord for, I could go on and on. There's just so much that, you know, uh, to say uh, but the Lord just blessed my heart so much in this trip. My name's Gail. <laughs> my name's Gail Cresswell, and um, I will agree with everything that's been said. Um, the other thing about the team coming together, which I really loved, is um, half the team, six, did not speak Spanish, and the other half did. And I don't think any of us thought about that when we signed up. It's just how the Lord brought us together. And that meant a lot on the trip because there was never a time where we didn't have somebody that we could depend on, Cookie a lot, <laughs> to help us with Spanish. Um, I think the trip would have been totally different if, um, if we didn't have that support. Um, I want to thank uh, a couple people. I thank my husband, first of all. He really encouraged me to tra take this trip. And um, I'm very grateful that I did. Uh, Jim and Sue are amazing missionaries. They love Spain. They love the Spanish people. Um, obviously, they've been there 20 years and have really dedicated their lives. Um, they love each other. They, um, along with Alex, did an amazing job with just all the logistics, as C Cookie mentioned. Um, spiritually speaking, um, I, too, was touched by when we went to Andorra. Uh, we met these missionaries, Patricia and um, Pedro, and uh, they have a small church of 15, 15 believers. They've been there for, again, 20 years. And um, they told us about kind of their story and bringing their children up there and how their children had really been shunned because they were Christians. 
and just the hardships, I don't think that we really realize uh, what families go through when they're identified as Christians and really persecuted for that. We hear about it, but this was somebody real in your face that you could uh, relate to. And then we went up to this beautiful park, and we were looking over the hillside, and here's the whole town, and uh, as we already mentioned, 8,000 people. And um, it just it just really broke my heart um, that there's 8,000 people there, and maybe 20 are saved. That was so in my face. Um, I mean, we hear that every Sunday. We know there's a lost world out there, but when you visibly see it, I think it really impacts you. Um, Fred talked about the darkness. We went to a, a cathedral, and um, it was all built around worshiping Mary. And uh, they have a, they actually had a kneeling bench and a wall. And behind the wall, I believe there's supposed to be a pillar with Mary on it. The bench was sagging, and the wall was indented where people have knelt and kissed the wall to, um, to give tribute to Mary. I never once, while we were there, heard the name of Jesus mentioned or Lord God the Father. Everything was Mary. So to me, that was um, pure idol worship. And I guess I had never actually seen that as well. Again, we hear about it. Um, so I think, I think we have to see things sometimes to really get impacted by it. Um, the people there were lovely uh, and friendly. Um, we met a lot of nice people. I, I think I'm, I'm going to let some of the others talk about what we did with the English class. And we still do have an opportunity in the future to touch these lives again through technology. They all use something called WhatsApp. So um, we can communicate with them, and, and hopefully down the road we'll have an opportunity to do that and share the gospel. Because as Fred already mentioned, they don't want to hear it. Um, but you develop that relationship, and uh, just like we do here, and then the Lord will open that opportunity for us. Good evening. I'm Nancy, and first of all, I would like to thank the Lord for the opportunity to go on this mission trip. This is my first trip, and I found it to be a wonderful experience. I also want to thank Alex for the hours and hours that he has put into the organization of this trip since March uh, through today. So, Alex, thank you. I also want to thank Roberto for the awesome photography that he did. Uh, even though he wasn't feeling well, the pictures that he provided us were really great. Our main goal in going to Spain, of course, as you've heard said, was to assist the tags in helping people to become more fluent in English. There are different levels that they have to prove themselves within in order to be certified. Um, jobs are a main issue in Spain, and when people are bilingual, that makes them much, much more uh, um, valuable to the workforce. So there's a, a big push there for English for that reason. So our goal was to help the tags with this. And praise the Lord, um, we had, I believe, 130 or more uh, contacts that are possible. So I would ask you to pray for um, the seeds that were sown, not just for this trip, but some of the other mission trips that have also um, been taken this year to the Indians um, and other trips that you have been told about. You hear people often say that in the United States we take things for granted, and very often people are referring to material things. This trip, as Gail has alluded to, really, really um, talked to me about how blessed we are in this country to be able to access fundamental churches. Um, is there a picture of Pedro? <laughs> Do you have that picture? 
um, Gail already alluded to this, um, Pedro is in Andorra. In an, Andorra is kind of a unusual city in that all of their, their architecture, all their buildings are kind of like built right on top of each other. Uh, we would never build a track like that in the US, but that's the way they are there. But the thing that was un outstanding about that, as I agree with what you said, is that when we were told through translation that there were 8,000 people in that town in a very, very powerful, strong reluctance to not only hear the gospel, but not to even associate with anybody that uh, was willing to go to the church. And I think to myself, Lord, where would I be if where I lived and where I worked a man that I worked with was not willing to share Christ with me. Where would I be? Where would my children be? Where would my grandchildren be? What would our eternal fate be if someone wasn't willing to talk to me? So being burdened for 8,000 people that are not willing to hear was something that I came away from heartbroken yeah. like you were. So again, I would ask you to continue to pray for these people um, because I think the tags may be their only link to the gospel, so hopefully that will take place. The fear of man brings a snare, and certainly these people are ensnared and unwilling even to hear. Um, like Fred said, the... the um, the way these people have been brought up to look at religion, they are so closed off to the idea of Jesus. Mary is the one that is esteemed, not Jesus. So, as I said, thinking about this and, and looking out over Andorra um, made me realize that how important it is for us to continue to financially support and prayerfully support our missionaries. As Pastor taught us on Sunday, missionary support is part of living our first love. It's part of doing what the Lord would have us to do. It's part of supporting our local church. I read recently that apostasy is only one generation away. That's scary to think about. So it's our goal to be faithful. It's our goal to pray for these people. It's our goal to um, to support them in any way that we can. So I thank God for being able to visit Spain. Again, I would covet your prayers on behalf of the people in Spain. Hi, I'm Ashley Main. And on my trip to Zaragoza, I had the chance to meet a lot of the teenagers of the city in the English nights. And as I talked to them and learned more about their stories, I found that just like us Americans, they're filling their lives with these things of the world rather than the things of God. And almost every teen that I met was looking forward to this past week when they had their Festival de Pilar, where there's a lot of partying and a lot of concerts and a lot of alcohol. And because their drinking age is 18, but so many of these young teenagers can slip by because the law is a lot more lenient there, and there was this group of girls that I was talking to who were looking forward to the festival, but they also, all they wanted to talk about was boys, and no matter how much I tried to divert the conversation, it was, they always came back to that one focus. And one of the girls, what she said, it like, it stuck with me and it broke my heart. She said, all I want is a boyfriend. If I just had a boyfriend, that would make me happy. And all these kids were they were grasping onto these things of the world and they were not filling that void with the only thing that can satisfy that void. And it was another reminder from God that even across the ocean there are still people out there who are lost and they're searching for fulfillment just like here at home. And I was able to connect with many of these teens on their social media and my prayer is that I can use it as an outlet to continue my ministry with them even as the trip has come to a close. And this trip really reminded me how important it is to go out and be a living testimony so people can see that there's a fuller life in Jesus than what's out in the world. So, yeah. 
my name is Therese Main. I'm Ashley's mom. And uh, how did I end up on this trip? Well, Ashley uh, took a couple years of Spanish, and her Spanish teacher said, if you ever get to go to Spain, you should. So it was like, OK, Ashley's going to go to Spain. And so um, I heard that Jane was going to go to Spain. And so I went to Jane, and I said, would you look out for Ashley on this trip? And she said, can I drug her on the plane? And then I was like, I think I'll just go to Spain. And so, <laughs> so I'm really glad that I did. She was joking, but her humor uh, is kind of what pushed me into it. And, uh, and God just kept opening the door. She really did say that. I know you all, she really, she admits to it. So, uh, but why did God? <laughs> <laughs> she did apologize. She was so sweet about it. But it's been a good joke that we've had ever since. So uh, why did God have me go to Spain? I'm still trying to figure that out. And up until today, I was still trying to figure that out. Uh, I had a pretty complicated summer. I don't know how many of you know my story. I had foot surgery back in May, and I had an embolism in June. And I think that God was kind of testing to see if I would still hear his leading, that I wouldn't let those things be excuses. And I think that there were some people on the trip that thought, she's not going to come on this trip. Um, and I think Alex was even kind of like, I don't know if she's coming on this trip. But I just told God, as long as the doors stay open, I'm going to keep on walking through. So to give you perspective, I was cleared to walk seven weeks before we left for Spain. So um, it was a little bit sketchy. I also do not speak any Spanish. I tried. Really, I tried. We got to the airport, and there was a little cafe where I thought I could just order a sandwich. I knew enough Spanish, right? Um, I tried to order this sandwich with queso, and the clerk laughed. Apparently, I said, I am cheese. And so at that point, I just decided it would be better for just Ashley to order all of the food from now on. Um, and so I can say that uh, with me hardly being able to walk and clearly not being able to speak the language, maybe God was showing me that we don't do missions on our abilities, but on his abilities. And I will tell you, I have uh, never met Jim or Sue. In fact, before this trip, I did not even know how to say Tagliolatella. All right, <laughs> but I do now. Maybe God is trying to show me that we are all a church family, no matter how far away people are. My favorite day was Andorra. You've heard a lot of talk about Andorra. We walked uphill both ways, and I'm not even kidding you about that. Uh, we were distributing tracts and the Gospel of John. My backpack was heavy. It was hot. I was sweaty. People did not like us being there. And maybe God was helping me see that serving him is sometimes hard, but it is always worth it. There was darkness in Andorra. And we were moving, you know, so you weren't really thinking about it. But boy, when you had a chance to stop, you kind of would get this feeling. Some people would not take what we handed out. Some people just looked unhappy to see us. And we kind of broke out into these smaller groups and then smaller groups and then smaller groups. And then I realized it was just me and Ashley, and we were supposed to go down and turn right and then left and meet in the center of town. I've never been to the town, so I'm not really sure where the center is. But there was this statue, and it was across from this bustling bar in the middle of the day. And I said, let's just sit here. Because you know, as a mom, you always tell your kids, if you're lost, don't move. Stay put, right? And we sat there, and I prayed. Maybe God wanted me to know that he hears our prayers everywhere. Now, the other missions trips I have taken have been to Haiti three times. Spain and Haiti are very different. There's Starbucks in Spain. Uh, but the people there have the same darkness as they have in Haiti. They both worship idols, and maybe God is showing me that everyone needs Jesus. And then there is this team. Can I tell you, I have never seen a group of people get along so well in for so long in such unpredictable conditions. Uh, Ashley and Roberto and Alex and I dubbed ourselves the Quad Squad because we kept ending up in the same car for the most epic road trips ever. Um, I was blessed that God gave me the opportunity to share the gospel, which, as you've heard from this team, was like unheard of. It was one of those things where I knew the Lord was opening the door, and I didn't know how to start. There were these three college girls, and one of them was wearing a headscarf. I don't know if you noticed it. And so I thought, I just have to ask her a question. And I said, are you Muslim? And she said, yes. And I said, can you tell me what that means? And then we talked about Islam and animal sacrifice and Jesus and the crucifixion. We covered pretty much all of it. Maybe God wanted to show me how easy it is to talk about him if only we would start the conversation. So why don't I talk about Jesus with more people now that I'm home? 
with my neighbors, with friends, with strangers at Starbucks. That is something I'm still trying to figure out. Will I go on another missions trip? I don't know. We'll have to see. Acts 1.8 says, You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. Why don't you go on a missions trip? I can't help but wonder if my summer of struggles is to show you that if a woman who could hardly walk and barely talk can do it, so can you. I got to stand up. Uh, as I said again, my name is Alex Sluke. Um, what I got from this mission trip, there, there was a lot. There's a lot that's been mentioned already. Um, so I don't want to double up on too much, uh, too many of the things. Uh, one of the things that got impressed upon me, though, was that this is the uh, fourth mission trip that I've been on, but this one was very uh, different. Uh, I mentioned this to a couple members of the group that the dynamics of this trip were different than the ones that I had taken in the past. This was the first one that I had uh, went on that was, um, you know, a group focus. Uh, I was in charge of, of <laughs> getting these people there and back safely and, and uh, completing our mission and everything, where I really hadn't done that on my previous trips. Um, and the Lord just opened my eyes to some things of how he can work through me and how he can work through each one of us if we're just willing vessels. Um, some of you know me a little bit better, some of you don't. I'm an accountant. I like to sit at my desk working on a spreadsheet, putting together all kinds of crazy formulas. That's what I like to do. That, that's my natural state, my natural habitat, okay? It's not gallivanting around the world um, trying to make sure that we can all, uh, you know, get along and, and uh, find out what we're supposed to do, where we're supposed to go, and minister to people with the gospel. That doesn't come natural to me. But if we open ourselves up to what God would have in our lives, and this was evidenced through this mission trip, through the other trips that I've been on so far, um, he can do some amazing things, and he can open our eyes to it. I know one of the themes that's coming up is just... Uh, the spiritual darkness, and the spiritual darkness is real. Um, there is something that you see when you get off the plane. If you've never been outside the U.S., Canada, I kind of consider U.S. <laughs> um, if you've never been anywhere other than that, I highly encourage you to go and to see what we're talking about. There is a darkness that's in this world. Yes, we see it here. There are some things that, that we see that are happening in our country um, that definitely have uh, Satan's forces behind them. There's a darkness in this world that is very real. Um, we can see it. Uh, I echo exactly what Fred was talking about there. You can feel it when you get off the plane, when you're there. I don't know how else to describe it. It was a pretty good description of it. Um, and this world needs Christ. Uh, the, the encouraging part of being in Spain and being in uh, the church that Jim and Sue have planted and being at, at the church there with the believers in the, in the village in Andorra that's been brought up a couple times was that even though there's the pockets of believers there, when you meet up with them, it's like you're home with family. And that amazing bond that we have in Christ, it spans oceans it spans continents, it, sp it spans languages. Um, that, that was really impressed to me uh, a lot this time going to Spain, is seeing just that brotherly love that's there in Christ. Uh, the, the, the relationship that I started to form last time I went, I was in Spain eight years ago, so this was my second time go going there, was with a man named Paco. And Paco was one of uh, Jim's uh, English students when I was there last time. He, I believe, at the time was unemployed, so he was with us a lot. He had some extra time on his hands and spent a lot more time with him on my first trip there. Since that time, he had gotten saved. He had had some um, pretty major medical issues uh, in, in the past few years that the Lord saw him through. And at this point, he's basically Jim's right-hand man. And to see that progress, to see the Lord working in someone that was far from him, that didn't have any idea who the Lord was, and the Lord used Jim and Sue in that man's life and in others' lives. And any of the group members can testify. Uh, Paco's testimony there at church, even if you didn't understand what he was saying, this guy's on fire for the Lord. And he's affecting his community, though the people might be closed, though they might be 
cold to the gospel, there is progress there, and there is something to be done each and every day. And I appreciate um, the Lord just helping to open my eyes more to it, and I pray that you would consider, if it's not Spain, somewhere else, and really just opening your horizons to what the Lord might show you in your life through missions. Hi, I'm Jane Pesky, and I have never been on a missions trip before. I've been to Zambia, but that was as mom and go-go, not as a missionary. So this was a totally new experience. But last spring when Kevin gave the challenge to go on a mission trip, I felt God nudging me. But I could come up with reasons not to go. Why would a woman in her mid-70s go on a mission trip? Come on. But God gave me the strength, and uh, it was fine. I had no problems with it. I know no Spanish. But God wanted me to go there to speak English. I didn't need to know. And like has been said, uh, we had Fred and Cookie and Roberto, and they were all great helps to us. And, of course, Jim and Sue. The third, as other people have said, it doesn't come just easily to me to start a conversation about God, about Jesus. There again, we were just to go and speak English with these people. This was not to go out and just start witnessing cold turkey out on the street or something like that. I could do that too. So I said, okay, I will go. When I've come back from Zambia, I've actually had more, more culture shock coming back to the States when you see how much we have here compared to what they have in Zambia. When I came back from Spain, um, one thing that really hit me is everybody lives in apartments. I enjoy living in the suburbs where you have grass and trees and flowers all around you. And I thought, oh, I wouldn't like to live in Spain. But if I had been born there and raised there, that's what I would know. So I would be okay with it. But then I carried that a little bit farther and I would also be in that darkness if I had been born in Spain. I would be one of those people that would take so long. Jim has been talking to a man once a week for over a year and a half just to build that relationship so that he could get into and eventually in a discussion about Jesus. I would be one of those people. Would I even listen? I don't know. And like has been said, um, we had these times, um, three nights a week from six to nine, talking to people in English, and there were some women that came back all three nights. And then one of them came to the English service on Sunday night. There were about seven or eight people that came to that service that we had talked to during the week. They stayed for the singing. When Alex started preaching, four of them got up and walked out. It's like, wow, <laughs> I don't see people doing that here when the preaching starts. At least people will listen. They'll give you a chance here. Those people didn't even want to hear it. But then one thing that did amaze me was when we went out in this village that people have talked about passing out uh, the Gospel of John. We're just putting them in mailboxes. And um, some of the mailboxes are right out on the street. And then some, it's just like here, they're apartment buildings, so you need to get past that outer door to get into the mailboxes. And I ended up kind of working with Jim part of the time, and he would just randomly ring doorbells. And if somebody answered, he'd say, propaganda. There was not one person that answered that did not push that buzzer and let us in. I said to him, what does that mean? He said, propaganda. <laughs> would you let somebody into your building? Because they said, propaganda? I don't think so. So then we just put tracks in all the mailboxes. How many got read? We have no idea. But at least that little seed was planted. So, you know, not every mission field is um, Haiti, Zambia, a third world country. I mean, Spain has some things that I think they're ahead of us. Um, we got into our room, and Gail and I couldn't figure out how to turn the lights on. I said, this isn't Zambia. They got power here. That's not the problem. Well, it turns out next to the door is this little box, and you put your uh, room card in there, and you can turn all the lights on. 
when you leave, you take it out, and so there's not leaving on lights and wasting electricity. Hey, energy saving. We don't do that here, so are we the country that's ahead or not? <laughs> so I would encourage any of you, go. If I can go, you can go. You guys already speak yet? <laughs> Hi, my name is Roberto, Roberto Ramos, um, and uh, before I begin, I just want to say that I come from the Bronx, 169th Street and Intervale Avenue, and in my family, I was not supposed to get ahead in anything, but here I am tonight, standing in the same altar where Pastor Kevin preaches on Sunday, and where Pastor Grace uh, used to preach it as well, and I feel very privileged. So, <clears throat> yes, there is a God. Now, uh, when I first went on the trip, you know, I, I'll be honest, I really went more for, you know, personal reasons. I'm going to Spain, home of my ancestors. And then uh, <clears throat> after I got there and I started to see the, the area, you know, you have these big, beautiful works of architecture, these cathedrals, and you have this little humble church in uh, Andorra. And uh, churches, I mean, uh, Spain is divided. You're either Catholic or you're atheist. There's really nothing, no room in between except for those little churches that we saw. What was it, two, two of them? Two little churches that we saw. So, you know, there is hope. Uh, when I first got, so when I got there, and we started giving these uh, classes from nine to six. I noticed, well, first of all, I'm a serious introvert, but I noticed that everybody was doing an excellent job and I was saying, what am I gonna do? Well, they give me a few folks that I could speak to. But then it hit me, it, you know, I'm still saying, what can I do? Because all of a sudden this tourist Roberto was leaving, the missionary Roberto was coming. So it was almost like the good Lord came up to me and said, you know, Roberto, you know, I know you're an excellent instructor, because that's what you do. And these people are excellent instructors too, and basically we got a little bit too many. So I got another job for you. Yes, you are gonna teach, but I got a job for you. He said, you got, you're carrying something that the others aren't carrying. That's your camera. I want you to go out and then start taking photos. Take some tourist photos, but I want you to use that camera for my reasons. Now, I used to want, it didn't hit me that way, right? It's just me saying it, my, me explaining it. So uh, I did take the photos I want to take, but then all of a sudden, I started using it more for the mission. What I said, this looks interesting. Somebody's working. Let me take a photo of that because that'll go into posterity. Then on Sunday, <clears throat> uh, we had the service where Alex gave an excellent message. And then we had our lunch or dinner over there. And I'm speaking with the folks. I'm trying to speak because, again, I really find it uncomfortable to speak. And uh, all of a sudden, the families are there. And I says, this is my opportunity now. This is the camera. So I started inviting the first family out. When we finish eating, won't you come on over, and I'll take a nice family photo of you. So then I did that family. Then the next family, and the next one, and the next one. I did something like four or five families, and basically it was just an act of goodwill, because remember, I'm representing God. I'm representing First Bible Baptist Church, Rochester in the United States. So I gotta do something to you know, uh, uh, make the bridge more passable. And that's what I did. And now all of a sudden I'm receiving all these goodwill uh, emails from the folks who I took the photos of, and I says, me? Where did this come from? But that's because I listened to the Lord instead of listening to myself. So I'm going to say this. If you've got the opportunity to go on a mission trip, go. Don't take for granted what we have here. Go to a country like Spain that it's either Catholic or atheist, and see what, what little seed you could plant. Whatever I spent on this mission trip, it wasn't enough. Thank you very much.
All right, I think we've heard some great stories, and, and, and one of the things that we want to see take place is what took place here is a group of people that weren't sure they could do it, and, and then they said, okay, God, I'm just going to trust you, and then they went, and they came back, and they, and they saw God at work, which is what we want to see, God at work in our lives. Mission Field doesn't need to just be Haiti. It doesn't need to be uh, just Zambia. It, it can be even in Rochester, New York, and part of this is kind of what Therese said. I, I could tell these Muslim people about Jesus, why can't I tell my neighbors? You know, if I can go to Spain and tell people about Jesus or be intentional about my faith, why can't I be intentional about my faith right here and right now? You know, they, they all kind of mentioned that there was a darkness. You know, I think, um, Hank Gale, you said looking out over those, over the, over the town of 8,000, thinking that maybe, maybe there was 20 among 8,000 that were saved, and it impacted her, didn't it? You could see that she was visibly moved, thinking, and that's really, it always makes me think of Matthew chapter 9 when Jesus looked at the multitudes and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And that's what happens when we go on a missions trip is we see there's a great big world out there that's way past Hilton or Greece or Spenceport or Ogden or Monroe County or the United States even that needs the gospel of Christ. And the cathedrals that are there and the idols of Mary and is not going to do it. It's going to take people that hear the call of God and that have the faith to say, God, this is crazy. I'm 75 years old. I don't know Spanish. What value do I have? But here am I. Send me. And that's really what we want to hear. We're, next year, we're going we're gonna to try to take a trip to Trinidad. Um, we're going to try to take a group of people to London, England. Uh, we're going to try to take a group to Verona, Italy. Uh, we may go back to, we may try to go to Zambia uh, again if they'll have us. So uh, we, want, we want you all to be a part of this as well, to, to do what these people did you know, sometimes when we talk about missionaries, we think of these giants of the faith that, you know, uh, walk on water in their spare time. Right, right, Dan? Is that what you? No, not quite. Okay. What we found is that God can use willing vessels, and that's all that God ever wants to do is use willing vessels. So why don't we be a vessel that God would use even here, even today? It can start tonight. It can start tomorrow. We don't have to go to London or, or Italy or Zambia or Haiti or Trinidad. We can live it actually right here. Let's pray together and we'll be